Bifocal, Chapter 7, J. Practice happened. Halfway through, I was starting to wish it hadn't. Coach wasn't in a good mood. I was getting used to the pattern. Every practice that was closer to the actual game day made him tenser, more difficult. Then, the day after the game, he was more relaxed, almost nice. Of course we'd won every game. I didn't want to find out what he'd be like the day after a loss. Maybe that would be the day I'd set off the smoke bomb in the locker room so he wouldn't have to find out. That's all it had been, a smoke bomb. I'd found out that I wasn't the only person who had thought about it being a bomb. Lots of students had thought that. So had some of the teachers. Maybe after what had happened, it wasn't such a stupid idea after all. Instead, it had been some stupid kid who had set it off in the stairwell, right in the stairwell, right in front of the school surveillance cameras mounted up on the wall. It was all there for the office to see. Of course, I hadn't seen the video, but one of the teachers who had seen it told another teacher who told us. Yesterday, we were like a scene from Law and Order and had been on the real news. Today, we were like a bad reality show, America's stupidest videos. The kid must have known there was a camera. I'd heard that he had pulled his shirt up to cover his face. He wasn't very big, and they said he looked like a grade niner. Odds were that he was just doing it to get out of class or some test he didn't want to take. If they caught him, he'd get his wish. There'd be no more classes and no more tests. He'd be suspended for the rest of the semester. Funny. All of this happened today, just a few hours ago. Everybody knew all about it. They knew about the video. They knew how tall he was and what he was wearing. But what about yesterday? All day I had waited for somebody, the principal, a teacher, anybody, to make some kind of announcement. Instead, there was nothing official. And without anything official, everybody just talked. Rumor instead of fact. Some of the talk had been about the prayer room. I found out it was one of the shop classes that wasn't used that much. It was a room right off the corridor where a bunch of brown kids had their lockers. Moose had told me that Muslims were supposed to pray five times a day. That seemed a little excessive to me. You'd figure that God might have better things to do than be bothered that many times every day. They said prayers in the shop room and talked about their Bible, the Koran, which was like their Bible. The whole thing sounded like going to church every day. One day, Sunday, was more than enough for anybody as far as I was concerned. Thank goodness my parents didn't even make me go that often. Every second or third week was enough for them. And they only made me go at Christmas and Easter, and a few extra times thrown in for good measure. You coming or what? Kevin asked as he stood holding the door open to the change room. Just gotta go to my locker for a second. Come on, let's get moving. Steve's probably already out by the car. I threw my things in a gym bag and hurried off for my locker. We headed down the hall. It was quiet. I liked that. We passed by the brown corridor lockers. Quite the smell, I said. Yeah, this hall always stinks. I think it's something these people eat, like curry or something. It oozes out of the pores. I meant the smoke, I said. Oh, yeah, the smoke. That kid was an idiot. Yeah, that was pretty stupid, setting off a smoke bomb in school. No, Kevin said. I didn't mean setting off the smoke bomb. I meant setting it off right in front of a security camera. If he'd been smart, he would have set it off on the second floor and dropped it down the stairwell. There's no camera on the second floor stairwell. Sounds like you've been thinking about this. He shook his head. I just know where the cameras are. We stopped in front of my locker. I undid the lock, and as I opened it up, some books fell from the top shelf. I tried and failed to catch them before they dropped to the floor. Ever wonder why you're playing linebacker instead of receiver, Kevin asked. I can catch, I said as I picked up the books and put them back into the locker. I just think it's better to give than receive. Receivers get hit and linemen do the hitting. Much better to hit than get hit. No argument there. I'd love to put a couple of licks on somebody sometime, but the QB doesn't get that chance very often. I grabbed a couple of shirts from the bottom of the locker, some sweat socks and a pair of sneakers. Wow, Kevin said. It's a good thing the police dogs didn't check out this locker. With their sensitive snouts, they might have passed out. Like it's worse than your locker. My locker smells like my sweat. Nobody minds the smell of their own sweat. Sort of like how you never think your own farts smell bad. Sometimes you amaze me, I said. Kevin grinned. Sometimes I even amaze myself. I slammed the locker door closed. The halls were completely empty now, and the caretakers had even turned off the lights in some of the corridors. Schools, empty schools, sort of spooked me. We opened the door to the stairwell, the stairwell where the smoke bomb had been set off. The smell of smoke was much, much stronger. Did you know that Moose's real name is Mustafa? I asked. 
Yeah, you didn't? No. Did you think his parents named him Moose? Of course not. I just figured it was a nickname because he's so big, like a moose. He's not that big, Kevin said. Moose and I go way back. We were in the same grade one class. Moose is a good guy. Yeah, he is. Did you know he goes to that shop class sometimes to say prayers? I didn't know that. I guess there's nothing wrong with that. I didn't say there was, I said. It just seems strange. Do you ever say prayers, Kevin asked. Of course, at meals, church, the usual. I also say prayers every night, but I wasn't going to admit that to him. Wave to the camera, Kevin said as we hit the first floor. I didn't wave, but I did look up at it. I was going to start noticing all those cameras. Not that I was going to do anything I needed to hide from. I read somewhere that if you worked or lived in the city, just walking around or driving and shopping, that you could be on dozens and dozens of different cameras every day. I guess there were good reasons to have those cameras everywhere. I'd heard that ever since 9-11, there were a lot more of them. That made perfect sense to me. What was wrong with being on video if you weren't doing anything wrong? Kevin's car was one of the last left in the parking lot. Steve was sitting on the hood, sort of a big black hood ornament. I got shotgun, Steve said. He said that every time. I never argued. As far as I was concerned, he deserved to be up front. He was assistant captain, a senior, and a lifelong friend of Kevin's. I was still the new guy. I have to make a stop, Kevin said as we started away. Where? I have to pick up something at the mall. Won't take long. The mall was just up ahead and on the way home. I didn't have any place that I was going anyways. Kevin curved off the road and into the mall parking lot. This is the worst parking lot in the world, he said. It's always pretty crowded, I agreed. Not just crowded. Crowded with the world's worst drivers. Look at this idiot. He slowed down and then brought the car to a stop behind another vehicle. It was sitting right in front of Walmart by the entrance, two feet away from the curb, locking the lane so that you had to swing into the line of oncoming traffic to get by. What the hell does she think she's doing, parking her car right there, blocking off traffic? Kevin fumed. We could see through the black window of the car that there were two women, one driving, the other in the passenger seat. They were both wearing big, swirling scarves. Stupid idiot. Can't drive because she can't see past that thing twisted around her head. Must be on so tight she's blocking the flow of blood to her brain. He waited as cars coming in the other direction passed through the open lane. The last car passed and he swung out into the open lane before anybody else could come from the other direction. To my surprise, he slammed on the brakes, bringing the car to a stop right beside the offending vehicle. He leaned over so he could look past Steve and through the open windows of both vehicles. Hey! Kevin screamed, and the driver turned. She was wearing a thick scarf that not only covered her head, but most of her face as well. What are you waiting for? he demanded. Can't you read the sign? It says no parking. You should be riding a camel instead of driving that piece of crap. Get moving unless you're planning a suicide bombing. Through her narrow slit in her headgear, I saw her eyes widen in shock and then fear. She rapidly started to roll up her window. Kevin rocketed the car forward, and with a squeal of rubber, we left them behind. He started laughing wildly. I found myself laughing, too, even as I slouched down in my seat. He hung a quick turn down the aisle, driving way too fast for a parking lot. He saw an empty spot and spun the car in, almost hitting a grocery cart that was off to the side of the space. Perfect parking job, he said as the car came to a stop. All the anger he'd just been spewing was completely gone. Are you impressed? You really went off on her, Steve said. She was blocking traffic, which was way different than what you did when you stopped right beside her, right? Steve asked. You want to be a backstreet driver? I might have to start putting you in the back seat. I was performing a service. Probably couldn't read the sign because she doesn't speak any English. We climbed out of the car. I looked over to where the car had been. It was gone now, but there was another car pulled off to the side, just up from where that car had been sitting. Lots of people park there and block the way, Steve said. I noticed them, too, when I'd been here at the mall with my parents. Just because lots of people does do it doesn't make it right. Besides, people shouldn't be able to drive wearing those stupid things on their heads. How can they see? That was the same argument I'd heard my father use more than once. I don't get the suicide bomber part. What did that mean? Steve questioned. That was stupid, Kevin agreed. No way in the world one of those people would ever blow up a Walmart. They practically live at Walmart. He had a point. I didn't go to Walmart very often, but when I did, it seemed like everybody in the place was from some place other than here. Maybe Walmart has a special section for them to get their headwear. Probably beside the bedding section. Don't some of those things look like bedding? I smiled. Some of them did. And another section, right beside the linens, would be where those guys can get towels for their heads. Those aren't Arabs. Those are Sikhs, aren't they? I asked. 
Sikhs, Arabs, same difference. I shook my head. Arabs are Muslims, and Sikhs aren't. They're from India, which makes them sort of Hindi, I think. Since when are you an expert on religions, Kevin demanded. He didn't sound happy. I should have kept my mouth closed to begin with. I'm no expert. This is getting uncomfortable. What are you picking up? I hope it's food, Steve said. I'm hungry. It is food. Dog food. I'm not that hungry, Steve joked. There was an outside door to pet value when we walked in. We followed Kevin down the aisle. He picked up a gigantic bag of food and tossed it on to his shoulder. He brought it up to the front counter and paid with his debit card. I got it, Steve said as he picked up the bag and put it on his shoulder. Wow, this is heavy. This is one big bag. I got one big dog. How much does Bruno weigh, I asked. He comes around 130 pounds. If I didn't know he was gentle, he'd be scary, I said. I had been a bit spooked the first time that dog came bouncing towards me. He was gigantic. He wouldn't harm a fly, but people don't know that, Kevin chuckled. I'd had him out for a run yesterday, had him off his leash at the park. There were some Chinese people walking through, and Bruno went running up to say hello. They started screaming and yelling. It was hilarious. I don't get it. Why are those people always afraid of dogs, Steve asked. Doesn't make sense to me, Kevin agreed. It's not like they never saw a dog before. Heck, it's not like they've never eaten a dog before. Maybe they're afraid that dogs are looking to bite them before they can bite the dogs. Steve started laughing and then began talking in a mock Chinese accent. You give me an order of pork fried rice, side order a poodle. Both Kevin and I laughed. Steve was one of the funniest people I know. I thought they just ate cat, I added. All house pets, Kevin said. My cousin told me a story about this Asian kid in his class when he was in grade two. Over Christmas, different kids took home the class pets. They had some mice and a couple of gerbils and a rabbit. Anyways, this little Asian kid takes home the rabbit. Christmas holidays end, and the kid brings back a thank you note from his parents, thanking the teacher for their Christmas meal. That's gross, Steve yelled. Do you think that really happened? My cousin swears, Kevin said. And how about that Chinese restaurant downtown that was busted? The health inspector found dead cats and dogs hanging in the freezer, Steve said. So you could have a spot of tea and a spot of spot, Kevin laughed. Kevin popped the trunk and Steve tossed the bag of dog food in. We climbed into the car. Sounds like an urban myth to me, Steve said. You know, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who saw it on the news. Kevin started to back up and then had to slam on the brakes as a car whizzed by. I got an urban myth for you, Kevin said. Did you hear about the Chinese driver who actually could drive? That's a myth, Steve agreed. Although I don't know anybody who knows anybody who's ever seen that. DWA, I said. What? Kevin asked. DWA, driving while Asian. That was what my father called it. Chinese drivers drove him crazy. There were no Chinese drivers back home. They both started laughing. Do you know how every racist joke starts, Kevin asked. I shook my head. He turned his head slightly and looked over my shoulder and then at the other. I started laughing. I don't get it, Steve said. I'm checking to see who's behind me before I start telling the joke. Get it? Okay, now I get it. Too bad it wasn't funny. And you could do better? Sure. How do you know when your house has been robbed by Asian burglars? Steve asked. I give up, Kevin said. How? The cat is missing and your kid's math homework has been done. The computer's been debugged and they're still trying to back out of the driveway. You really are a racist, Kevin said and started laughing. Me? How can I be racist? I'm black. Last time I checked, your mother was white. She's just really, really light-skinned. She has blonde hair, Kevin said. Die job. And blue eyes, and she's Swedish, isn't she? You saying there's nobody black in Sweden? I'm not even sure there's anybody in Sweden who has black hair, Kevin said. All I can think of are beautiful, tall, blonde babes playing volleyball, I said. That is a very fine image, Kevin agreed, bouncing up and down. You white guys just don't get it, Steve said. Us, white guys, Kevin asked. Yeah, you know who you are. You haven't lived the pain of slavery, being denied your rights, the prejudice I experienced because of the color of my skin. Shouldn't a man be judged by his character rather than the color of his skin? Steve was joking around. Wasn't he? I couldn't tell by his tone or expression, but he couldn't be serious, could he? You're right about judging people by their character, Kevin agreed. And you are one big character. Steve, you crack me up. The only crack I know is the sound of the white man's whip against my skin. Steve, you're such a... And that's another thing. Stop calling me Steve. That's my slave name. Steve suddenly broke into a big grin and started laughing. 
I can think of a few other things I could call you, but then I'd be a racist. Do you want to shut up now, or do I have to put you in the trunk with the dog food? I'll stay quiet, master. Sir, sure wouldn't want no uppity blacks talking black to white folks. Not enough you want us in the back of the bus. You want us in the trunk of the bus. I'd heard Steve do this sort of routine a dozen times. Do people ever really give you a hard time about being black, I asked. Some people are jerks. Nobody who matters does, and that's all that matters. But what about the racial jokes? Do they bother you? Depends. I like racial jokes. Unless they're black jokes. Those jokes aren't funny. He paused. Unless somebody black says them. His expression and voice were completely serious, almost ominous. I suddenly regretted getting this started. Everybody else better watch their mouth, Steve said. And that includes you two honky crackers, he said, pointing a finger first at Kevin and then at me. If you know what's good for you, you'll watch your mouth. I'm carrying and I could cut you. He suddenly reached into his pocket and pulled out a set of nail clippers. Damn, I thought all black people carried a knife, Steve said. He held the little clippers up in the air. This would have been way more dramatic if it had been a knife. But still, one more word from either of you and I'm going to give you a manicure. I could still cut you bad. I could do some serious damage to your cuticles. We all started laughing. And Kevin, could you stop on the way home so I could get some KFC? You know how us black folks just loves our chicken. If you could get me some of that KFC, it would make me so happy I might just break into a song and start shuffling and dancing.